Rachel. And I'm Sam. Welcome to the next episode in our series about making your app safe and secure. Today, we want to give you the tools you need to start thinking about app security and user privacy from the very beginning of app development. Let's review how Firebase security is different from security in a traditional app. In a traditional architecture, there's a client, a server, and a storage layer. The server acts as a natural security check. Because you control the server and the code that's running on it, it's a trusted environment, and the server makes all the requests to the database. In Firebase, there's no server, and the client connects directly to the storage layer. You don't control the clients, so those aren't trusted environments. So how will you prevent a user from reading all the data or overwriting all of it? How do you enforce that, for example, in this to-do app, I can only see my to-dos and you can only see your to-dos? The answer is security rules. Security rules let you specify which parts of the Firebase backend each client can access. Security rules are executed on every request. A request from a client will go through security rules. And if security rules says the request is allowed, the backend will send the response. Otherwise, they'll get a permission denied error. For example, you can write a simple rule that says signed in users can create a new document if they're listed as the owner, or you could create a more complicated rule that a user can only modify a comment they've made if they have a karma score over 15, if they made the original comment less than two hours ago, and if the modified comment is shorter than the original comment. You can create all sorts of different conditions for who can read and edit different kinds of documents, but whether they are simple or complicated, it's essential that you write security rules. Ideally, start writing rules as soon as you start writing your app, because security rules will change how you structure your data. So we'll cover the tools, new and old, that let you do that. Let's dive into what security rules look like. First, match statements define which parts of the backend the following rules will apply to. For Firestore, the match statements end at the document level. We include the collection and then make the document ID variable by putting it in curly braces. This rule will apply to all the top level documents in this collection, and the document ID will be available within the block. For storage, the match statements include bucket names and end at the file level. When you're writing rules, you want to avoid global rules, rules that match the entire database or bucket. Instead, you want to write rules that are tailored to each kind of document. Granular rules act like a schema. You can see what fields you have in each document, what the types of each field should be, and who has access to it. Next, we define a specific permission. The available permissions for Firestore are create, update, delete, get, and list. Additionally, read is an alias for both get and list, and write is an alias for create, update, and delete. If you write overlapping rules, for example, a rule that allows creates and a rule that allows writes, if any rule evaluates to true, the user will have access. Rules aren't filters. If any rule grants access, access is granted on the whole request. A way to avoid mistakes is to have each document match only one rule. Finally, each rule needs a condition. If you want to lock down your app entirely, the condition could be as simple as false, but the options for conditions are limitless. There are two important objects to use over and over again in the conditions for your security rules. First, the resource object is the document that the user is trying to access as it's currently written in the database. If this is the create method, the resource object will be empty. If I structured the Firestore document for an item in my to-do list to have an owner UID field, I can write a rule that checks this UID. I want to compare it to the ID of the user who is making the request. For that, I'll need the other important object in the rules conditions, the request object. The request object contains all the attributes related to the request, including the path or the query that's being accessed, the new or updated resource that the request wants to write, and in the auth object, details about the user who's making that request. So I can finish my rule by comparing the user ID I have in the database to the ID of the user who's making the request. These aren't the only types of objects and functions that you have access to, but these are the most important. 
We've linked to the ref docs in the description so you can dive in more. And you can use custom functions and local variables in your security rules. To make your code easier to read and reduce duplication, when you have conditions that are repeated again and again across your rules, you can pull those into a function. Instead of repeating this logic, you can now call the function. Here, I've replaced all the conditions that made an exception for site admins with a call to one single function. Within functions, you can also create local variables using the keyword let. This is particularly handy for writing readable code. This hasn't changed the logic at all, but it's much more readable. That's the syntax of rules. Next, let's think about what kinds of security rules that you want to write. You can make it a lot easier on yourself if you start thinking about security rules as soon as you start thinking about the data that you want to save. Who should be able to read, create, update, or delete this final data? If you're about to save a document where some fields are public and some are private, use a subcollection to put them in separate documents. Remember, Firestore rules apply to documents. So creating two documents in subcollections means that you can write two different security rules for each of them. Here, I've written two security rules, one for the data that needs to be private and one for data that other people in the app need to be able to read. We've linked in the notes to a video on how to model your data in Firestore. Security rules can also contain data validations. Access control rules are absolutely required because they protect your users' data from malicious actors. By contrast, validations are here to make your life easier by enforcing the types and constraints of the data being entered into your database. For example, I expect this data to always be an integer between 1 and 24, so to prevent any funny business, I make that a requirement to save the data. Similarly, here I enforce which fields are required. There are limits to what you can do with validations and rules. You'll still want to use client-side validations for most things as well, because they will give the user feedback that they need to change something. And if you're making any writes from Firebase functions or another trusted environment, the admin SDK skips Firebase rules entirely. So make sure that whatever it's writing matches your validations. Here, I've made the created at timestamp and owner immutable. People can update this document, but if someone tries to change those particular values, the write will fail. Map diffs are a relatively new feature to security rules. They let you compare original values to updated values. I'm comparing the request.resource.data to the already saved resource.data, and then checking to make sure that my immutable fields are both unchanged in the write. Map diffs are great for this kind of thing. We know that writing security rules can feel really high stakes. You don't want to make a mistake that grants access to someone who shouldn't have it. We've created several tools for you to experiment with uh, and then even libraries for you to write automated tests against your security rules. The most important tool is the Firebase Emulator Suite, a local emulation of Firebase backend services. With the emulators, you can test your security rules either manually by clicking around or with automated tests using the rules unit testing library if you're writing tests in JavaScript. In my automated test, here I've stubbed out the user attributes I want to test, and then in each test I make a specific SDK call and I declare if that request should succeed or fail. I've added these tests to my CI setup to make sure I won't accidentally break my security rules in the future. We've included in the links below a video about how to get these kinds of tests set up to run as GitHub Actions. The emulator suite is also a great place to build and debug without slowing down requests. Two features worth highlighting are the debug function and the requests monitor. The debug function lets you inspect any value in your rules file. I can call debug on any expression in my rules, I'll add it here around request.time, and make sure that it's in the format I expect. And when I run my test, it prints to standard out. Requests Monitor is a cool new feature we just released. It lets you see the requests coming into the Firestore emulator in real time and allows you to drill down into any request. You can see all the attributes of the request and what happened during rules evaluation. This tool is especially handy when you're writing your rules and you're not sure which fields the rules have access to. For example, you can see all the fields attached to the auth object 
in request.auth. When you start building your app, you can watch the request monitor and see all the parameters that are coming in as part of the request and start writing rules from the very beginning. That's it for this video. My final tip is that I recently released a code lab to help you get up and running on rules, and it's linked in the description below. The code lab covers how to think through and write a variety of rules. It takes about an hour, and it will really level you up in how you're thinking about and writing your security rules. Sam, what's your final tip? Let me see. Uh, security rules are business logic, like the rest of your app's code. So it's important you treat them like that. When you make changes to security rules, review them like you would the rest of your code. A link to our guide on how to review security rules is below the video. To recap our tips, avoid global rules. Rarely do you want one permission for every document in your database. Rules aren't inherited through subcollections. Write separate rules for documents that are in subcollections. Rules don't act as filters. If any rule grants access, that user will have access. All client requests go through security rules, but requests from trusted environments use the admin SDK and they bypass security rules. Avoid duplication, meaning both avoid repeating logic and avoid overlapping rules. Use the emulator suite and the tools there for debugging and testing your rules like the debug function and request monitor. Treat your security rules like the rest of your code. Test them, code review them, and check them in. That's all. Thanks so much for listening in. We'll see you next time when Rosalind gives us the lowdown on Firebase App Check. <laughs> <laughs>